<laughs> so if those of you who attended the inflation lecture last week will remember that I had to cut short at the end my discussion of inflationary perturbations. And so I decided that instead of just launching straight into dark energy today, I'd first finish off what I was doing on inflation because it's, inflation and dark energy are very closely related. The unifying theme between them is in the title. It's the fact that I'm in both epochs of the universe's history, there is an acceleration in the, in the expansion rate. So I'll remind you of something that you will have seen many times by now in different forms, the Friedman equation, which gives us the rate of expansion of the universe, the velocity of expansion, if you like. And so that tells us that all of the matter and energy density sources in the universe drive the ex expansion of the universe with a curvature term making some difference at early times. And the second field equation, the, what you could call the ray order equation, which gives us a double dot, the second time derivative of the scale factor. And that has this very important property that the acceleration, which is A double dot, will be positive if and only if the term rho plus 3p, the energy density plus 3 times the pressure, if and only if that is negative. So we know the criterion for acceleration, and I discussed that with you not sure that that's any better. I spent quite a bit of time explaining this last time in, during inflation, and I won't go through that again. But this is the key condition either for inflation or for a period of acceleration in the late universe, which is driven by perhaps something which we will call dark energy. I'll come to that a little later. So if we introduce what's called the equation of state parameter W, which is just the, the ratio of pressure to energy density, then the condition for acceleration is that W should be less than minus one-third. So in particular, we need the universe to be dominated by some form of energy which has not only a negative pressure, but it's more negative than one-third times the energy density. If we look at the more familiar forms of matter and energy in the, in the universe like radiation, cold dark matter, and baryons, they certainly don't satisfy this criterion. W is either a third or zero. But if we consider the vacuum energy, which is, corresponds to the cosmological constant, W is minus one in that case, and we obviously do get acceleration. We know that because this corresponds to the De Sitter universe that I described previously, which is expanding at an exponential rate. So certainly it's accelerating. And then I did, I'll just remind you, for a scalar field, the W is much more complicated. It involves the kinetic energy and the potential energy in, in a way which allows also for this condition to be satisfied, as I'll show in the next slide. All right, so that's, those equations there you should have seen in various guises a number of times by now, but these are the basic building blocks of how we understand the dynamics of accelerating universes. Now, we can ask the question, what is it that's going to drive an accelerated expansion in the universe? How do we get A double dot positive? Well, there are two ways that I will discuss, and they're actually the first one is a special case of the second. We can either have what we could call from a quantum point of view a, a vacuum energy source dominating the universe. So the vacuum energy is the energy of the ground state of some, some quantum field. You can show that the only possible Lorentz invariant energy momentum, momentum tensor, which we would think of as a necessary requirement for this vacuum, is an energy momentum tensor which is proportional to the metric. This is Lorentz invariant and no other form of energy momentum tensors, Lorentz invariant. And if you work it out, it has to be minus the energy density. That's the scalar proportionality in this relationship here. And then it's not hard to show that that energy density, if you look at the Einstein's field equations, just has to be essentially the cosmological constant divided by an appropriate normalization factor, 8 pi g, the gravitational constant. 
And you can also show from this energy momentum tensor that this, the pressure associated with this energy momentum tensor must be equal to minus the energy density. So W equals minus 1. The equation of state parameters minus 1 definitely satisfies the criterion for acceleration. And you can solve the field equation, the Friedman equation, to show that the Hubble rate is constant and the scale factor is growing exponentially. So certainly that's a simple form of acceleration. You can see a scale factor which is growing exponentially clearly is concave upwards, so it clearly has a double dot positive. Now, the second way to get it is through a scalar field, as, as I did describe last time, so I don't want to go into too much detail. A scalar field is a more general case because in this case, instead of just having a simple constant potential, we now have a potential which can depend on the value of the scalar field phi. So I've drawn, say, some typical scalar field here which may have two, minima, two local minima and a maximum, for example, in the range of scalar fields that I've shown. If the scalar field were located at this minimum, which is a stable minimum, it would have no kinetic energy. If the scalar field were somewhere here, it would be rolling down its potential hill, so the kinetic energy would be non-zero. Now, it can be shown, and I discussed this last time, I won't go through the details again, but it can be shown that such a scalar field has an energy density and a pressure which are simply made up of combinations of the kinetic energy and the potential energy. So the energy density is just the sum of the kinetic energy density and the potential energy density. And the pressure turns out to be the difference, kinetic minus potential. One can show this from a simple quantum field theory analysis of the scalar field, which I think you probably have done somewhere in one of your lectures. Uh, and this is what comes out. And as an exercise, I leave for you to show that the equation of state parameter is less than minus a third if and only if the kinetic, if and only if phi dot squared is less than V. So the kinetic energy is actually less than a half the potential. So, for example, in this position here, clearly the kinetic energy is zero and the potential is positive, so we will have accelerating in expansion certainly in that position. In fact, this will be just this kind of acceleration because it's as if you had a constant potential corresponding to that lambda. If the potential is rolling down its hill over here, it depends how steep the hill is. If it's rolling too fast, you won't satisfy this condition and you won't have acceleration. You'll have some decelerating expansion of the universe. But if the slope of the potential is flat enough so that the rolling is slow enough, then certainly the kinetic energy will be small enough to satisfy this condition, and then you will have accelerated expansion. So it's important that we pick up this idea of a slow rolling scalar field. It simply means that the potential is flat enough, so the derivatives of the potential are small enough, that the kinetic energy is much less than the potential. Uh, I only have to have it just less than, but if I want to get W closer to minus 1, which is the, the exponential type expansion, then I want phi dot squared much less than V, and that's what's known as slow roll. Of course, if phi dot squared is exactly equal to V, then you're just at the critical boundary between non-slow roll and, and slow roll in the, in the more extreme case. Okay, so again, I did actually go through that previously, so this is a bit of a, a reminder from, from what we discussed last time. The slow rolling case, in the slow rolling case, you will have a nearly exponential expansion with nearly constant Hubble rate. Now, as I described, well, let me just, two more things. As an exercise, I, I did leave this as an exercise last time, but let me just remind you again. You can take the, the expressions I gave you for the energy density and the pressure and put them into the energy conservation equation and show that that gives you what's known as the Klein-Gordon equation, the top equation here. Phi double dot, the second time derivative, plus 3h phi dot plus the d, v by d phi equals zero. The Klein-Gordon equation for a scalar field is just the energy conservation equation. 
It's a very important equation in quantum field theory, and I'm sure you've come across it before. But typically, you'll come across it without this H term, because you typically will have seen it not in the context of the expanding universe, but in a flat space-time, in laboratory-type space-time. So this term here tells us that due to the expansion of the universe, there's a damping, a damping term in the wave equation satisfied by phi. For the Friedman equation, we'd simply re replace rho by v plus a half phi dot squared. Now, these red dotted lines here just tell you that in the slow roll case, I can neglect those two terms relative to the other terms. If the field is slow rolling down a quite flat potential, then the acceleration of the field is going to be very small. We can neglect it. And, of course, the slow roll condition requires that the kinetic term is much smaller than the potential term. So I can neglect this term relative to that one. And so inflationary dynamics, or more generally speaking, if you want the universe to accelerate under the influence of a scalar field which dominates the energy density, then, and to be nearly exponentially accelerating, then you can apply these two equations with the two red dotted terms taken out. And I did mention last time a very simple example would be provided by the quadratic potential. V is a half m squared phi squared, where m represents the mass of the scalar field. That's a simple quadratic curve. It has to be very flat to allow the slow roll to happen, so that means that in some sense m needs to be small to open up the parabola of the quadratic, make it flat enough. And then at some, at some point... What's happening also, as I mentioned last time, as the scalar field is rolling down its hill, it's also fluctuating because it's a quantum field. So these green arrows here represent the fluctuations or the perturbations that are being generated. At some point, the perturbations responsible for the large-scale behavior of, of the CMB anisotropies is generated. That's to say the quadrupole from CMB would be generated around about this value of phi, which happens to be about three Planck masses although that's not important for us now. When that happens, we want the slow roll conditions to be in place. And then as the field rolls down its hill, eventually it reaches the critical point where V equals phi dot squared. It no longer is accelerating, and it starts to decelerate. And that's good for us, too, because we need to get out of this inflation period in the early universe. It comes down towards its minimum, and it, as it comes through the minimum at phi equals zero it has some velocity, so it's going to go past and it's going to oscillate. Because of the damping term here, the oscillations are going to get smaller and smaller. And this is the reheating period when the energy density in the field is converted to radiation. Now, a lot of the things that I've been saying are going to also apply to dark energy. But before we move on to dark energy, let's uh, finish off what I was wanted to do at the end of last time, which is to talk about perturbations during inflation. Remember that one of the most important things that inflation does is, it provide, is to provide a mechanism to explain the seeds that lead to galaxies in the universe. So let's just have a brief look at the key qualitative ideas involved behind that statement. Suppose I choose a particular instant of time, and I'm using conformal time here because it turns out to be useful. Remember the conformal time, if you, if you don't remember it. Let me just remind you. I can write the metric of a Friedman model in normal proper time. Let's take a flat Friedman model for simplicity. Or I can write it in conformal time so that it's proportional to a flat Minkowski metric. And this just turns out to be a very useful representation, as you've seen quite a number of times before. Now, suppose I take an instant of time. The actual scalar field, the classical scalar field in the background is just going to be a constant because... The Friedman universe is spatially homogeneous. That means at each instant of time, every physical scalar is a constant across the surface t, t naught equals constant. But this is, a quantum, this is a quantum field, and it's, it can't be exactly constant. 
Due to the uncertainty principle, or due to the creation of virtual particles, which the creation and annihilation going on all the time, however you want to understand it, every quantum scalar field is going to be subject to fluctuations. So there are going to be these stochastic perturbations in the value of the field at different positions in space. The, the field is going to un undergo these perturbations delta phi, which depend not only on the time that you're looking at, but also on the position where you are. And the key thing is that I've just frozen time in one instant here, but the universe is actually accelerating. It's expanding super fast. And what's happening is that these little fluctuations I've drawn here are being stretched. Remember that every physical scale in the expanding universe is stretched proportional to the scale factor. So if I have a, a scale lambda which could correspond to the wavelength of one of these modes here, that is proportional to A, and A is proportional to or approximately equal to an, an exponential. So every scale is being stretched exponentially fast. And so these tiny quantum fluctuations which originate from some quantum source get turned into very large scale uh, fluctuations by the expansion of the universe. The nature of these quantum fluctuations is that on average they, vary, they vanish but on average, their amplitude is not zero. Okay? So they actually do have a, a real existence in the sense that you can't switch them off. You can't treat the scalar field as if it's exactly smooth and constant at each point of time. It genuinely has these fluctuations. And ex that's exactly what we need, really, because this turns out to be useful. We don't want to get rid of these things. They're exactly the things that are going to be the seeds for the later growth of galaxies. So the idea here is that the fluctuations in the field, which come from a quantum origin, they feed into, in turn into the metric. So they create perturbations in the metric. So this is the exact background metric, but the, the background metric is also going to start wobbling. You think of Einstein's field equations. On the left-hand side, you have the Einstein curvature tensor, and on the right-hand side, you have the, the matter. So if the matter is wobbling then, of course, the Einstein tensor has to start wobbling to keep the field equation satisfied. And so the metric, which is the, what determines the Einstein tensor, that's also going to start wobbling, and that has to fluctuate. Then later on, after inflation, these wobbles in the metric are going to be translated into wobbles in the radiation and matter, the, either the energy density or the temperature of the, of the radiation. And that is what's going to lead to those famous anisotropies in the microwave background sky that you've heard so much about, and which Peter Dunsby will talk more about tomorrow. So we, we've got a, a scalar field which has the non-fluctuating classical background part plus the quantum fluctuations. We have a metric which I've written in the conformal form as it is on the right there, but now with the little fluctuations it turns out that the fluctuations can be described by one single field, capital Phi. I haven't written it down on the slide there, but of course, capital Phi will be a function of conformal time and position in space. So basically, the metric is a Robertson-Walker metric plus small perturbations on top, small little wiggles that make it not perfectly homogeneous and isotropic. There is some small dependence on the space-time position, which you can't have in an exact Robertson-Walker. And that's obviously right, because an exact Robertson-Walker can't have galaxies or can't have a single thing in it which is not completely smooth. It can't even have an ant. You put an ant in a Robertson-Walker metric, it's no longer exactly Robertson-Walker. So these are the little wiggles that are going to start growing into galaxies and also later produce ants. Well, that's a good question. Now, there are different ways. There's, there's, there are a lot of subtleties involved in how you can write the wiggles in the metric and also actually in the scalar field. I've chosen the simplest possible way with its, in the simplest coordinate system where it turns out that I can reduce it down to one, one variable, capital Phi. But there are other ways of writing it in which you have more than one variable. The point is that essentially you can get rid of the other variables by 
choosing the coordinates that I've chosen here. So it is possible to write the metric down in a different way from this. But the point is you can always simplify it down to this way by making the correct choice. And essentially, there's just one degree of freedom here. The reason for that is that we have a simple scalar field driving the universe's expansion. If I start asking what effect do the radiation and the cold, dark matter and the neutrinos have, then this gets a bit more complicated. But we're not going to worry about that because we're just looking at inflation where we can, we can ignore the radiation, we can ignore the baryons, we can ignore all other forms of matter. The scalar field is completely dominant. So we can have this very simple form here. Yes? Um, the form inside the brackets is uh, basically polarized gravity. Um, well spotted. So yes, well spotted. That, then interpreted as uh, gravitational potential. Exactly. Excellent question. So in fact, we can interpret phi exactly as a gravitational potential from this first term here. So that's exactly the form that it has in the, in the weak gravitational field. This, this is different from what you would see in normal linearized gravity, which is not on an expanding background. But yes, this, this, because of that, you can actually think of phi as a gravitational potential in some sense. And perhaps Peter Dunsby will, will um, I think he will actually say more about that in his talk tomorrow. He'll go a bit more into the structure of the perturbations in the metric and what, what the various variables mean. Um, so I'll just set the scene for him to take it further. Now, I don't want to get technical, but I just want to outline to you how we follow the sequence from phi to g to the temperature in a very rough sense, so that you can see how one actually analyzes the perturbations that start in inflation and tracks them through to, to the observations of the microwave background and isotropies. It turns out that if you define this variable chi, as I've written here, it satisfies a very simple wave equation. Now, chi is given by the scale factor times a combination of the field perturbations, delta phi, with the metric perturbations, capital phi, and there's this normalizing um, term next to the capital phi. Phi prime is the, just the derivative of the background field with respect to conformal time. A is the scale factor, H is the Hubble rate. If you define this particular combination of perturbations, you can show that during slow roll inflation, it satisfies this very simple wave equation. And what's good about that e equation in the bottom box there is that it's essentially a harmonic oscillator quantum type equation where the wave number is not just k squared, but k squared minus a double prime over a. So the expansion of the universe comes in to affect the effective wave number in this quantum oscillator equation. And this kind of quantum oscillator equation, essentially the equation chi double prime plus omega squared chi is zero, that's very well understood in quantum field theory, and one can understand those fluctuations that I was telling you about in terms of this equation quite easily. I can't go into the details, but I can just outline to you what actually happens. You may remember from last time when I discussed inflation that the conformal time during inflation can be given as minus 1 over AH. Remember, the conformal time goes from minus infinity and grows, but it's always negative during inflation. And because of that simple expression, I leave it for you as an exercise to show that A double prime over A is approximately minus 2 over tau squared. So perhaps I should just write there another simple exercise for you here. You can also notice that K times the absolute value of the proper time is, is very closely equal to K over AH. And remember, AH is that key quantity that tells us whether we're inside or outside the Hubble radius. Now, in any case, using the expressions from inflation, I can then rewrite this wave equation, this oscillator equation, as k squared minus 2 over tau squared for the effective frequency, the effective omega squared. And then you can see there are two key regimes of solution here. Either this term here is 
is ignorable, or this term here is ignorable, in two different regimes. So the first regime is when k times tau is much greater than 1, so that I can throw away the 2 over tau squared term because it's much smaller than the k squared term. By this expression here, this is the same as saying that the co-moving Hubble length is much greater than the co-moving wavelength. So in other words, the perturbation is well inside the Hubble radius. It's a small-scale perturbation. And in this case, sorry, that V there should be a chi, shouldn't it? This, there's a chi. There you have a... So, sorry, dash throughout is d by d tau. So let me write that down here. As to distinguish it from the dot, which is d by d t. These equations, as I said earlier, they all look a lot simpler and clearer in terms of conformal time, which is why I've used conformal time. In this regime, when I can neglect that, we have a simple harmonic oscillator with a solution e to the minus i k tau, so it's just a, describing the fluctuations inside the Hubble radius. Now, as I told you earlier, the expansion of the universe is going to stretch these things very rapidly so that the wavelength becomes bigger than the Hubble radius. And that is the opposite regime when I can neglect that term relative to this term. That's when k mod tau is much less than 1, or the co-moving Hubble radius is much less than the co-moving wavelength. So the wavelength of the fluctuation is much bigger than the Hubble sphere, which gives us the region of causal connection between things. And in that regime, the solution is approximately chi goes like A. Because the solution here, you can see, is chi goes like 1 over tau. Easy for you to check that that is a solution of this equation. And 1 over tau from above is proportional to A. So in other words, this chi variable is growing like the scale factor in that regime. And we've got this basic idea here that, crucial to inflation, is summarized in this last sentence here. Perturbation modes, remember a mode is just a Fourier mode in my analysis here, so it corresponds to a given value of k. Perturbation modes are generated sub-Hubble. In other words, they're generated inside the Hubble radius on very small scales, generated by quantum processes, where they oscillate like plane waves. And then they are rapidly stretched to super-Hubble scales. They, they stretch to become much bigger than the Hubble radius. Remember, during inflation, the Hubble radius stays approximately constant. It's only gradually increasing, very slowly. Whereas A, lambda is going proportional to A, and A is exponential. So the wavelength of the mode is rapidly expanding. So very quickly, it's going to be stretched outside the sphere of causal connection. And because it's gone outside the sphere where it can be affected by other causes, other particles and effects, it becomes frozen. It's as if it's become completely frozen, impervious to any causal physics. And so it sits outside the Hubble radius until later, and I'll tell you in the next slide what happens later. Not only does it become frozen, but it also becomes classical, and that's something which is a bit more complicated, which I can't really go into. Essentially, the perturbations are quantum in nature when they're below the Hubble radius. They become classical when they're frozen outside the Hubble radius, and that's... That's a bit of a subtlety which, which I really can't go into and is not easy to explain in any um, qualitative terms, although maybe one of you knows a way to do it. I'd be happy to hear that if anyone does. Is everyone basically happy with the idea here? From a mathematical point of view, all I've done is taken this oscillator equation and identified two regimes where first I can neglect that term, then I get the solution, Second one, I can neglect this term, and then I get that solution. But the physical explanation, the physical interpretation is in terms of these little pictures here, summarized in the statement here. This is the physical framework where this mathematical equation is part of the model. And so what we end up with is this very nice connection between microphysics and macrophysics. At the microphysics scale, the quantum field, which is subject to quantum fluctuations of the vacuum, 
creation and annihilation of particles. These little fluctuations are stretched to cosmologically massive scales where they can later on become the seeds for the growth of galaxies. So it's a fascinating connection between the quantum and the classical, the small and the large, the very early universe and the late universe. It's a very simple, very effective, and very powerful framework for understanding how structure forms in the universe. And I'll end off just by this final slide here on the perturbation section. I'm already running out of time for this. It turns out furthermore that during slow roll, that chi perturbation variable I showed you is actually A times a very important thing called zeta. Now, zeta is the curvature perturbation. If I take a surface of constant background energy density, and then I ask, what are the curvature perturbations of that surface due to these perturbations in phi and the perturbations in the metric? You get a quantity called zeta. And there's a very important theorem of perturbation theory in cosmology, which I can't prove for you because I don't have time, but Peter should discuss it more tomorrow, that says the following. On super Hubble scales, in other words, for modes whose wavelength is bigger than the Hubble radius, the curvature perturbation is a conserved quantity. It's constant. And that is an absolutely fundamental, important result because it allows you to do the following. I start during, at, at inflation, as the mode is stretched outside the Hubble radius. So this red line here is the wavelength of one mode. Remember, it's growing like the scale factor. So I'm just using a logarithmic plot here. The blue line is the Hubble radius H inverse. During inflation, it's very nearly constant. During radiation, it grows. And during matter, it also grows just slightly, not, slightly less fast. This mode is generated below the Hubble radius in a quantum process, and it's quickly stretched to the point where it crosses the Hubble radius. After it's crossed the Hubble radius, its curvature perturbation variable value zeta is a constant, zeta star. And it stays outside the Hubble radius for billions of years with zeta star being constant. It's frozen. It's a perturbation which has a frozen constant value associated with it. It has no effect on anything in the universe while it's outside there. Later on, when the universe has stopped inflating and radiation eras ended, the matter era started, it turns out that because the Hubble radius is growing, it will eventually swallow this mode again. It will come back inside the Hubble radius. So it crosses the Hubble radius. Two things happen. One, it carries this constant value of the curvature perturbation with it. So it's going to come inside the Hubble radius and start causing wiggles associated with that value zeta star. And you know exactly what it is because you calculated it at inflation. So you can connect 10 to the minus 32 seconds after the Big Bang with billions of years after the Big Bang with just a simple constant zeta star. And it turns out that the temperature fluctuations on the very largest scales are just proportional to zeta star, as Peter will describe to you tomorrow. As it comes inside the Hubble radius later in the universe, billions of years later, it now has an effect on the physics of the constituent of a, of a cosmic plasma, because now you're inside the Hubble radius again, causal physics can operate. Okay? Outside here, you're immune from causal physics because you're on such a large scale. But once it comes in again, it creates an impact. It has an impact. It creates perturbations in the matter and the temperature. And these are the seeds which lead later to galaxies. So that is, an, in a thumbnail sketch, how things work in the inflationary model from the point of view of its properties for creating structure in the universe. And Peter Dunsby will tomorrow pick up these ideas and make them a bit more concrete. But hopefully that gives you some kind of a basis to understand uh, a starting point for Peter's discussions tomorrow. I think it's tomorrow. I hope it's tomorrow. But anyway, it's after me, either tomorrow or the next day. Are there any questions on that before I go to the second and last part, which is to do with dark energy? Anybody have? Yeah. Well, there's no current prognosis. 
So there are, there's a lot of theoretical activity trying to take ideas, especially from string theory and supersymmetry, to try to motivate particular forms of potential for particular kinds of scalar field. The success so far is really rather patchy. And to be honest, there, there isn't really much great... Uh, there's, there's no dramatic su success up to now. But the hope remains that high energy modifications to the standard model of particle physics, and in particular, hopefully, string theory modifications, the hope is that they will lead to a very clear model of inflation. Or else they will lead to something which is not inflation, but somehow shares many of the properties of inflation, something that we don't yet understand. But up to now, we still don't know. So as I said last time, and as George emphasized, and maybe this is a, a good point in response to your question to say again, the inflationary model has wonderful successes in terms of how it can account for things, but it has this one massive weakness that there's no fundamental theory to explain what the inflaton might be and what the potential V of phi might be. We still have that big gap. So there's lots of room for young theorists to go in there with ideas. The problems by no means have all been solved. Only some of the problems have been solved. Any other questions? Okay, so in the last 20 minutes, I think we started slightly late, so we may have five minutes after that for questions. Let me move on to give you some of the basic ideas of this rather strangely named stuff called dark energy. I haven't bothered to define it because I know that a number of speakers have referred to it over the course of the, the summer school. But just to remind you, the... Uh, You've got dark matter in the universe. That is matter which is not visible to telescopes. So when we look out in the sky, we see stars and galaxies. That We know there's lots of dark matter out there from indirect evidence, but we can't see it, so we call it dark. Now, dark energy is also not visible to our telescopes. It's some form of energy density. It's not matter in the sense of having zero pressure. It actually has a negative pressure because it's accelerating the universe. But it's dark because we can't detect it directly. We can't see it with our telescopes. We can't point a detector in one part of the sky and see, ah, oh, there's some dark energy with such and such a quant uh, quality. All we can say is that there is this stuff out there because that's the only way we can explain how the universe is behaving. So that's why we call it dark energy. It's not a very good word, but it's a word that's stuck, so I'll use it. Dark energy can come in two forms. It can either be the constant form of a cosmological constant, which is a, the simplest form of dark energy. Now, that's also dark because you can't see the cosmological constant, but you can measure its indirect effects. Or it can be a scalar field like, exactly like in inflation, but just happening in the late universe rather than the early universe, also slow rolling. So you have different forms of dark energy, they're united by one fact. They cause the universe to accelerate. That's, that's the key thing. So why do we think the universe is accelerating? Well, there's mounting evidence to show that the universe is accelerating. It's not completely cut and dried, but the evidence is building up, and it's becoming more impressive. And it's essentially based on two key things, although there are other aspects as well. First of all, the supernovae redshifts, and these have been described to you before, but I'll briefly go over them in a minute. And secondly, the CMB anisotropies. These are the two key bits of evidence for acceleration of the universe. Supernovae are these exploding stars, and they have peculiar proper special properties which allow us to estimate the distance from us to them. And so if we point, when we point our telescopes at these supernovae, we find that they're dimmer than we would expect them to be. And the reason for that has been interpreted as the fact that the universe is expanding faster than we thought. So we think we know the distance to them, and we think we know the expansion rate, but it turns out they're moving away from us much faster than we thought. That's why they look dimmer. And so we detect an acceleration through the fact that supernovae are dimmer than we think they should be as functions of their redshift. CMB anisotropies also provide strong indirect evidence that the universe is accelerating at late times. There are various features of the CMB anisotropies which indicate the presence of this dark energy because otherwise we can't explain all the features in the CMB anisotropy curves. And both of these bits of evidence indicate that the acceleration is recent. 
within the last, a redshift of about one or so onwards. So it's not all the way back to nucleosynthesis because if the universe had been accelerating from nucleosynthesis, we wouldn't have been able to form galaxies. You can't get matter to clump together into stars and galaxies if space is ripping itself apart at the speed of light. You think about it, it's just not possible. There's no way the universe could have been accelerating through most of its history, otherwise there could be no galaxies. But the evidence is that in the late universe, from about a redshift of one onwards up to the present time, the evidence from supernovae and CMB is that that acceleration has been happening in that period of the universe's history. So if we assume that this dark energy is the simplest kind of dark energy, namely a constant cosmological constant, Friedman's equation for the late universe tells me that there's the expansion rate is determined by the matter, the cold dark matter and baryons. We can neglect the radiation in the late universe and by the dark energy. And we can divide through by h squared to normalize this to the density parameters for matter and the density parameter for dark energy or the cosmological constant. So this, as I emphasize, this is constant dark energy with the constant potential W is exactly equal to minus 1. We can have more complicated versions, but for the moment, let's just think of the simplest case of dark energy. You can then set up a phase, pl a, a, a phase plot, if you like, of omega lambda versus omega matter and try to plot the, the data coming from various, or the, the regions of this plot which are consistent with the data coming from different observations. And it turns out that, roughly speaking, we have the following structure. I've drawn in a black line here the flat model where the Friedman model has got zero curvature. This, this black line is simply where omega lambda plus omega m equals 1, which is a flat model. I've got no curvature term there. K is zero. So we expect that the universe lies very close to this black line because of what I discussed previously about inflation and its effect on curvature. Turns out that the W map data from the CMB puts us in this red region, roughly, of the of the uh, omega lambda omega m plot. The supernova data put us in a less well-defined because they're not as accurate as CMB. W map is extremely accurate. They put us in this blue region here, which very interestingly is orthogonal to the red region. If you think about it, it could have been the case that these two regions were parallel and didn't intersect. Then what would we do? <laughs> We'd have to go back to the drawing board and say something's wrong with our theory because the one piece of evidence puts us here and the other puts us there and they don't have anything in common. Therefore, something would be completely wrong with your, theory, your whole theoretical framework. You'd have to go back and work it out all over again. But it turns out they are orthogonal to each other and they intersect in a reasonable area. And then the third bit of evidence from the behavior of galaxies, their velocities and how they cluster, they put us in, the, in this green area here, which is roughly vertical. And again, it could have been that that green area was somewhere out here, so it didn't intersect where the red and blue intersect. But you can see there is some intersection between all three bits of the key data. And that actually puts us at the, most, the best fit model, which is omega lambda is about 0.7, omega matter is about 0.3. Omega radiation is of the order of 10 to the minus 5. You can more or less neglect it in the late universe. So we have this very remarkable number of facts here. First of all, the three different pieces of increasingly sophisticated observational data are consistent with each other. That's truly remarkable. And secondly, even just as remarkable if you like, they are telling us, they are indicating to us, that the dominant component in the universe is this mysterious dark energy stuff which we don't really understand. So that's two really remarkable pieces of information coming from, from observations. George Ellis spent a, a bit of time des describing that to you, so I won't go further into it, but please interrupt me if you want me to say anything, explain anything more. Now, that's all very nice, and it's, it looks very successful, and the data is extremely impressive, but again, underlying it are some problems, so let's try and highlight what these problems are because they'll give us a better understanding. The first problem we run into is, well, what, what is this dark energy? Even if it's the simplest case of the cosmological constant, we have to explain 
where this cosmological constant comes from. It's no good just to put it into the equation and say, okay, that fits the data. We're physicists. We want to know where it comes from. Why? Why is it there? Where does it come from? So this is a big question. It could be vacuum energy. And if it is, this leads us to another problem, which I'll come to later, that won't solve the problem, but we need to find out. It could be either the cosmological constant or a vacuum energy, or it could be a, a slow rolling scalar field. This is often in the literature called quintessence. So if you see the term quintessence, quintessence is a form of dark energy, which is different from vacuum energy because it's evolving, it's changing with time. The vacuum energy corresponding to the cosmological constant is an absolute constant. Lambda is fixed. It never changes with the expansion of the universe. But a scalar field, sometimes called quintessence, which is slow rolling, it has to slow roll because we want to accelerate the universe. A slow rolling scalar field, that is the other possibility for dark energy. There are actually some other exotic possibilities, but I won't go into them. These are the two key, most likely, if you like, possibilities or most discussed possibilities. One quick comment before I go further. If it is the vacuum energy case, then the universe will accelerate forever because this constant lambda is not changing. It's just keeping, it's there and it's just causing acceleration and it will carry on causing acceleration. So the future of the universe is a future of permanent acceleration, if that's the case. If, on the other hand, it's an, a, a scalar field which is rolling along its potential, eventually it's going to get to some minimum and it's going to stop accelerating. So in this case, we expect the universe will eventually stop accelerating and start decelerating in most cases. Okay? So the differences could be very important for the future of the universe, as well as having current small differences. So that's one question, and the answer to this question is still unknown. It's, it's a bit like the inflaton question. What is the inflaton? We don't know. What is the dark energy? We just don't know. But... It's an interesting question, and it's out there for us to try and solve. The second big question is, okay, let's forget the first question. Let's just say, if somebody's going to solve that question, now let's work on some other aspects, because as physicists, you have to do that all the time. If you refuse to move forward until you'd answer all questions, you'd never get anywhere. So you have to kind of parcel out your problems into manageable bits. If you run into a brick wall, you say, okay, we'll leave that for the minute. Let's look at something else. So we move to the next question. And the striking thing is that if you look at that evidence that I showed you on the plot previously, from a qualitative point of view, omega lambda and omega matter are the same, 0 0.7, 0 0.3. They, you know, they're both order of one. Order of magnitude numbers, they're the same number, the same order of magnitude. And if you think about it, this is actually a, a profoundly important observation because the omega lambda is constant in time. And the omega matter is evolving like 1 over a cubed. So the ratio of omega lambda to omega matter is growing like a cubed. Why are we now, at 13.7 billion years after the Big Bang, why are we now at a special time where these two things are equal? Whereas during the whole rest of the universe's history and the rest of its future, these two quantities are very different from each other. So we just happen to be living in a time when they're nearly equal. Why is that? That's a strange coincidence, which we can't actually explain. Now, you might like as an exercise not just to derive this simple thing, but also to try and reproduce this plot I've got here, which shows the radiation matter and cosmological constant density parameters along, against the log of the scale factor. I should just indicate here that this, this ignores inflation, so this starts here with reheating, after reheating. It's not difficult to actually show. You have the following situation. In, just after reheating, the universe is dominated by radiation. That's exactly what reheating does. It turns you from an, the inflaton dominance to a hot universe, which is radiation dominated. So omega r is 1. And it carries on dominating until minus, log of minus 10 here, that corresponds to roundabout Big Bang nuclear synthesis. And then it starts to drop until it reaches a point just before decoupling, really, where matter starts to take over. So the matter is completely negligible during the radiation era, but then it starts to grow because, remember, radiation is falling like 1 over A to the 4. Very simple facts will show you 
how to get to this diagram. Radiation is going like 1 over a to the 4. Matter is going like 1 over a cubed. And the, the vacuum energy density is going like a to the 0. These are, these are the basic facts. So you can see that eventually, because this is dropping faster than that, eventually the matter will dominate over radiation. And because this is not dropping at all, eventually this will dominate over that. And the, the diagram you get on a log, vertical, a, a horizontal log scale is this one here. The red line is the radiation density parameter. It drops off towards zero. Naught here corresponds to the current time. So in the future, the cosmological constant will become completely domino, dominant. But at the current time, they, you're crossing around here at about 0.7 for omega lambda and 0.3 for the blue line here, down here. But as you run time forward, omega lambda will completely dominate and matter will become completely negligible. So as an exercise, you might like to reproduce the key features of this plot just using those simple properties on the right, on the green board, and make, being careful to use a log scale on the, on the horizontal. So we have these two key puzzles neither of which we can currently solve. What is the dark energy? We don't know, but we, we have some options to look into. And why does the dark energy have the same order of magnitude in its energy density as the matter today, in this special time of the universe, universe's history when we were observing it? It's a very unlikely circumstance that these two very widely different and growingly different quantities should be equal, roughly equal now when we observe them. Why is that? It's a strange coincidence that is not understood. So let me just emphasize again here, this, this plot here could be another exercise. Okay? So I should move to a conclusion now. There is, in fact, a third deeply puzzling question. <laughs> you, you don't lose heart with all these unsolved problems. They, they actually make physics and cosmology more exciting there. So we, we shouldn't get too worried about them. They just show that we've still got a long way to go. Even if we were to answer those two problems that I've just been describing, there's one remaining problem which is, in a sense, even more fundamental than those two. Even if it turns out that the dark energy is not the cosmological constant but is some quintessence scalar field, we still don't get around this, this particular problem. Why is the vacuum energy so small? So quantum field theory tells us that we expect the existence for any quantum field of a non-zero vacuum energy density. The way to see this is something like the following. You can think of a quantum field as a field of harmonic oscillators. And you know that each harmonic oscillator has a zero point or a, a ground state energy of a half h cross omega. So if you think of a field of oscillators forming a quantum field and you add up all the ground state energies, actually it goes to infinity. But you can renormalize this in a, by techniques of quantum field theory. Essentially, you have a cutoff energy, if you like. This is one way of thinking of it. The cutoff energy we can think of as being the Planck scale because we know that at energies higher than the Planck scale, quantum field theory is going to break down, general relativity is going to break down. Now, if you put this cutoff into your quantum field theory, you can show that the total vacuum energy in a quantum field is of the order of the cutoff energy scale to the 4. Okay, and the, if the cutoff scale is chosen as the Planck scale, then you get 10 to the 19 GeV to the 4 for the energy density in the vacuum of space-time. Now, if you look at observations and say, okay, Omega lambda is 0.7. What does that correspond to in, in energy density units? Well, it turns out to be 10 to the minus 3 electron volts to the 4 compared to 10 to the 19 giga electron volts to the 4. It's a little bit of a difference, as you will agree. In other words, the energy scale of the vacuum as we observe it is about 10 to the minus 30 times what we might expect from a back-of-the-envelope theory guess or prediction. And this is really a very, very big problem because that's an embarrassment. Why, how on earth can we be 30 orders of magnitude out in our energy scale? Something's wrong here. 
on one or either sides of those equations. Now, it is true that if you use supersymmetry, which has some nice properties that you can cancel out vacuum energies of bosons and fermions, fermions and so on, if you use supersymmetry in string theory, you can reduce that factor of minus 30, but only by you know, a few, so 10 to the minus 15 or something. It's still a massive discrepancy. You can't solve the problem by current methods of that, that we understand in supersymmetry and string theory. Is Well, I, I, pref I prefer to take it in terms of energy scales rather than energy densities, because I think here you're just blowing it up by a factor of four artificially. So I think it's, not, it's, it's, it's useful to think in terms of energy scales rather than energy density scales. So it's usually described as a 120 orders of magnitude, because rho v observed is about 10 to the minus 30 to the 4 times rho v theory. But it's probably more fair to say it's 30 orders of magnitude in energy scale. It does sound like a bit of a cheat. It sounds like you're trying to make it less, but 30 orders of magnitude is bad enough, isn't it? So regardless of all the other questions and their answers, this, this question is, in a sense, more f fundamental. This is really a particle physics problem. So I, as a cosmologist, will just ask the particle physicists to solve that. I'll end off then, because I'm already over time a little bit. I'll end off just by a couple of comments, the first of which is a warning. Everything I've said has been based on the assumption that we are interpreting the observations correctly and that our basic theory is correct. And if those two assumptions hold, then the universe is accelerating and all these other problems follow. But it may be that our interpretation of the data is wrong in some sense. For example, as photons come to us from distant supernovae, it may be that a small number of them, due to interaction with magnetic fields, intergalactic magnetic fields, a small number of them may be converting into something like axions. So you get less photons than you think. The supernovae look dimmer than they are, not because of acceleration, but because of some particle physics phenomenon associated with photon conversion into other particles. In fact, if you try to do that, use that theory, you find it doesn't fit all the data. So, but in any case, I'm just giving you one example. It may be at a more fundamental level that the evolution in supernovae is more complicated than we think. And so when we estimate how far the supernovae is, the supernovae are, we're wrong because we're not taking account of internal evolutions that we don't understand. And there are various other possibilities that may mean that we're misinterpreting the data. But it's increasingly difficult to show this because lots of things have to conspire for that to be true. But nevertheless, it's not ruled out. Secondly, it also may be that general relativity, we know it doesn't hold at the very high energies near the Planck scale because it's a classical theory. It may be that it actually doesn't hold also at very large scales of the order of the Hubble radius. We haven't tested GR out to those scales. We've tested it on Earth-bound scales and solar system scales. We've got very strong indirect tests from nuclear synthesis and the CMB at decoupling. GR, there's very strong evidence indirectly for GR because otherwise we wouldn't be able to understand things so clearly. But on very large scales of the current Hubble radius, there's no way that we've been able to test the GR holes. And it may be that the Friedman equation I'm using actually doesn't work. And so when we interpret an acceleration, it's actually a different Friedman equation that we just haven't found yet. And there's some... Uh, string theory and brain world related um, ideas that, that, that can give theories like that, although again they don't really solve the problem, they're, they're not satisfactory. But we do need to bear in mind these warnings, that it's not necessarily uh, the situation as I've described it. It's, it seems likely, but it's not, it's not yet confirmed. And finally I just wanted to say the, the, make the following comment, that if the universe is indeed accelerating in its recent history, what can we say are the key effects of that? Well, there are two things. One I mentioned already, but I'll just end by um, highlighting it again. And that is that structure formation is slowed down. And in a sense, this is, this is consistent with what we observe in galaxies. That's why the galaxy, uh, the green sort of area on that plot I showed you is consistent with these observations because we would otherwise have too much structure if we didn't have this acceleration. 
as I said to you, if, you're trying, if, if gravity is trying to clump together under attractive force of its own attraction of the particles, this is counteracted by a negative pressure anti-gravity effect of dark energy, which is hurling particles apart at very high rate. And eventually, when the anti-gravity effect of dark energy becomes strong enough, structure formation becomes impossible and no, no longer proceeds. The other key thing is that the future of the universe can be very dramatically different. And this is something that I've also mentioned, but just to end off with. If the dark energy is a cosmological constant, then we will accelerate forever into the future, because this is just a constant. It doesn't change. If we have a quintessence field which is slow rolling and which is going to end up in some minimum in most models, then it's going to start decelerating just like we did, just like we ended inflation with a slow rolling, slow rolling inflaton. And there are other models in which the universe actually starts to collapse after acceleration. For example, the cyclic models that are inspired by brain world and string theory. So let me end there with a whole series of unanswered questions. who you've spoken to. <laughs> the, uh, I don't know how the, the two camps divide in terms of numbers, but there's certainly a lot of people who believe that the physics of type 1a supernovae are, are pretty well understood and well under control. There's a minority of skeptics who are trying to point to the fact that, they, that this physics is not actually that well understood. Others who point to um, less well-known properties of dust and how dust could affect the... Inter the dust between us and the supernova could also affect the, the way in which we see the light coming from it. But one has to say that the skeptics haven't really come up with anything compelling. Well, you know, again, you know, it depends who you talk to. There's some people who, who feel that, that the models are pretty well understood and being increasingly tied down. I mean, it's true that when you, when you get down to the physics of a supernova, the numerical simulations which, which are being conducted to understand how supernovae behave are at the sort of edge of te technological and numerical uh, current uh, abilities, if you like, state of the art. And the state of the art is being stretched almost, or I suppose, a little bit beyond its capacity. So it's true that we don't fully understand them. I, I personally don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm neutral on that because I haven't studied supernovae, and I'm, I'm not sure who's right of these. It's, it's, it's best to know that there are two, at least two different sets of ideas about supernovae. Another question? Answer. So you're talking about question revealed that suppressed power of low multiples on the CMB spectrum. What implications, if any, uh, does this have for dark energy? Okay, good question. So what Einstein is talking about is the the following feature in the CMB, maybe I should put that, yeah, thanks. You remember the CMB power spectrum is against the, the spherical harmonic wave number L, so that as you go to higher L, you're getting to smaller angles. And this, the canonical plot looks something like that. So this is on the largest scales. And in fact, the quadrupole, which is the first point here, the data point is well below, and the octopole, which is L equals 3, is also significantly below, not quite as bad, the theoretical curve. This flat part here is called the Sachs-Wolf Plateau, which Peter will speak to you about tomorrow. Now, actually, it's not quite flat. It's, it's, it's got a bit of a curve. Not only are these points below, but the, the, the standard model wants this, this bit here to start rising rather than falling. Now, the, the warning here is that the statistical significance of these two points is, is not clear. For the, 
small values of L or on the large scales, the, st the statistics is very tricky. And the significance of, of how low these points are is, is under debate. But if we say that that's real and the quadrupole is smaller than we think, how, how can we explain it? Well, the thing is that a cosmological constant, if you increase the cosmological constant or any other form of dark energy, you go in the wrong direction. You're just going to bring this curve higher. The more dark energy I put in, the higher this curve goes. Okay, so there's, there's no solution to that problem. It's an anti-solution. To get this loss of power requires, it is much more tricky. And some people have been trying to look at string theory type ideas, looking at modifications to GR in the early universe to see if they can account for this. Other people have looked at particular kinds of inflationary models which have special features which cause a loss of power on large scales. But none of these attempted explanations looks natural or convincing. That, that's another nice big problem for theorists. Why, if there is a real loss of power, how can we explain it? Yeah. Um, what, what would, uh, what would, how would uh, changing the natural topology of this affect that description? Well, there are particular models. There's some closed models where <coughs> k is plus 1. where you can actually get this loss of power, but they are very artificial. There's one of them in particular which uses a topology of the universe, which is a dodecahedral, dodecahedral topology. So if you put a dodecahedral topology on a k equals plus 1 model, you can account for this loss of power. But then you've got to explain why the universe should have this very special and very weird topology. And <laughs> nobody's come up with a convincing explanation. But it, it, you're right that topology can affect it, although it doesn't typically cause a loss. It can do other things. Another question? Any other yeah. general questions, which are also appropriate for the first point? Or do only have to be under the technical one? Okay, actually, uh, I should mention that um, Amanda will be giving the talk she was going to give last week, even at this week, at noon on Wednesday. Great. Other scenarios.